Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is out in theaters, sequel to the phenomenal 2018 animated film. I was blown away by that one. Uh, I, it was a perfect 10 out of 10 film for me. And now I'm very, very pleased to say that this, that I think the sequel absolutely lives up to the same standard uh, and, and continues to be flawless. Uh, apparently it's the longest ever American animated film uh, at 2 hours and 20 minutes. It also had the largest production crew of any animation ever with around a thousand people being involved in the work. Crazy, but believe me, it all paid off. So the story, without spoiling too much, uh, but beware, there will be some slight spoilers because I do want to talk about the story structure a little bit. Uh, but okay, the story starts with uh, the breathtaking prologue uh, focusing on Gwen Stacy, the spider woman we met in the previous film. It explains her backstory, her point of view uh, in the events of the previous film, and then catches up with what happened, with her, with her, what happened to her uh, since. Now we switch back to Miles Morales. Uh, it's been over a year since the events of the last film. Miles is now more confident, more experienced, more at ease with being Spider-Man. Uh, however, when a ridiculous, unassuming villain called The Spot accidentally escapes into the multiverse, it turns out that the paths between worlds are still very much open and Miles will have to team up with this secret organization, secret society of spider people from all the different worlds to stop the multiverse from unraveling. All right, where to start? Um, first off, the film is very firmly a middle chapter in a larger story. Uh, unlike the first movie, uh, it, it can't really be treated as a standalone. With the first film, you could have watched that, you could have walked away from it, never seen the sequel, and you'd still end up being very satisfied with the story. Uh, this one essentially ends on a cliffhanger, with the next film promising to, to continue the same storyline. As such, I think it executes two things really well. First of all, it uses the advantage that being in that narrative position gives you, which is that it can and it does go pretty dark and not resolve everything nicely by the end. It's very much an Empire Strikes Back situation where events are very much uncertain. I like that. I like that the movie allowed itself to 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 be bold with it, with with where it you know with where it went. Uh, however, that can also sometimes be a trap because if you end everything on a cliffhanger it can feel unsatisfying for the viewer uh, and and this is the second thing I think that the movie does that the movie gets uh, quite well and it avoids this trap by having Gwen be essentially almost a co-lead in the in the story her story her subplot and her universe are used as bookends to the film uh, it starts with her and it sort of ends with her in a way and because her specific subplot does get resolved by the end, you get the satisfaction from there. And there's also that amazing hype feeling in the end where you realize, okay, Gwen is done, this is gonna be all miles again from now on. But enough about the ending. Uh, what I also really liked about the story structure is the sort of patient way that it all comes together. Uh, I mean, the true nature of the conflict in the film only becomes apparent as we go into the third act. Uh, everything before that is kind of a misdirection, a smokescreen, but not really because it still all very much fits together. Uh, in general, I thought it's a stroke of genius to have the villain be the Spot, who is a man comprised of dimensional holes, and then the main source of conflict be a plot hole, a literal plot hole. I think it's brilliant. Um, plus it's also a fascinating meta-narrative about Spider-Man as a character across all of his history in the comic books and other media. You see, the one thing that always seems to plague Spider-Man as a character is that even though he existed in various iterations for half a century now, it seems that the writers always insist on, on reverting back to the same tried ideas, the same plot points, the same story beats, the same tragic defining events. And having Across the Spider-Verse be a sort of denial and criticism of that eternal status quo is, I think, really inspired writing. As, as someone who's familiar with the greater history of comics, I, I thought that was a great commentary on, on the history of the whole character. And then, on the more surface level, you have a really well-done mirror between Miles and Spot, 
who both want to be taken more seriously but are met with condescension and dismissals from the people around them. So there are two sides of the same coin in a way. Uh, I think all of the other characters in the film are fantastic. I mean, Gwen and Miles' relationship really shines. There's a proper focus on family as the emotional core of, of each of the stories. I liked Miguel O'Hara uh, as the sort of primal, dangerous Spider-Man. Uh, the voice acting by Oscar Isaac really makes him seem, you know, threatening. Uh, but then still, you 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 see why he has different views than Miles in the end. You completely understand him, understand where he's coming from and the pain that he experiences. And his actions make sense, but then so do Miles's. Uh, on the other hand, we've got things like the incredibly upbeat Indian Spider-Man, the show-stealing Spider-Punk, uh, the no-nonsense Jessica Drew. Great characters. Once again, a really splendid job on, on the supporting cast here. Of course, there's also like hundreds of different versions of Spider-Man showing up here and there as larger and smaller cameos and tons of little references uh, and callbacks and winks at the audience to the comic books, to the previous movies, to the video games even, uh, to the MCU. Uh, but as much as I feared based on the trailers that this aspect may end up taking over the movie completely and just becoming a festival of references, it absolutely doesn't. It, it's all there, but it never takes the attention away from what matters in the story. Uh, then we get to the technical aspects. The animation is spectacular. I mean, it looks gorgeous. Do yourself a favor and see it on the biggest screen you can. It's kinetic and lively and has a distinct style, or rather styles. Uh, because this time around, not only do the different characters look different based on what world they're from, the different worlds do as well, especially the world of Gwen Stacy is just a work of art with the watercolor paint making every image look like a sort of fantastic painting. It really is unbelievable all the way through in terms of the, the visuals. Uh, I equally love the music, both the score, which again blends different genres and elements together, and the soundtrack which features some amazing songs. It really adds to the movie's spirit. And you know, I could keep going about this, but I'm afraid I'm gonna end up speaking longer than the movie itself, which, by the way, for a 20-hour, 20 20-minute 20 film, flies by real fast. There's great pacing in it. But the point is, it's amazing. Uh, I had high expectations, and I think somehow Across the Spider-Verse managed to exceed those expectations. I am eagerly awaiting the final part of the trilogy, and honestly, if it keeps up the quality, I really think it will go down in the history as, as one of the best perfect trilogies of all time. For now though, I'm seriously thinking about going to see this one in a movie theater once again.